Hi everyone, welcome to the first module for Kinesi 7103 Design and Analysis 1, which is taught in the Department of Health Kinesiology and Recreation here at the University of Utah. Uh, my name is Keith Lose, I'm an assistant professor and hiker, uh, and I am the instructor for this course. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about the class and the structure of Design and Analysis 1, and some of the more fundamental concepts that we're going to be going through as we explore the wider area of data analysis. So the first thing is that we're going to operate on a flipped classroom model. So every week we're going to have lecture materials that are posted online. That way you can watch and rewatch the lectures in your own time. Um, and the lectures are going to be more focused on the reading and sort of being congruent with the reading and proving uh, theories or con important concepts that are discussed in the course. So the lectures will tend to be maybe a bit more technical, whereas the work that we do together in lab will be a bit more applied. And in the lab, we're going to complete assignments that require to you to use the concepts that are discussed in the lecture. Um, so usually, you'll uh, prior to the class, you're going to have to take a quiz based on the lectures, um, just to, to sort of test your understanding and, and give you a little bit of a sense of what you know and what you don't know heading into the lab. Uh, and then in the lab itself, we're going to really focus on putting theory into practice with assignments. And these might be simulations to actually show what random sampling kind of looks like if we actually could sample hundreds of times or thousands of times. Um, ways in which we can manipulate data, because oftentimes we'll have data in one format when we want it in a different format in order to analyze it all of the different analyses we might want to do, and also different methods of graphing or visualizing data to make sure that the interpretation of our data is clear. So the links for the videos for the lectures, the scripts for the lab assignments, and all other course materials can be found on the course webpage, um, but they are also listed on my personal website, the address for which uh, is, is here. Now, uh, the textbook for the course is Data Analysis, a Model Comparison Approach by Judd McClellan and Ryan. We're using the third edition of the book, which has this blue cover. Uh, and hopefully, you've already taken a crack at chapter one, and you're going to be familiar with this idea that we're going to have a general theoretical model of data equals model plus error. So within this framework, the data are the fundamental scores or observations that we're going to have access to. The data are you know, the numbers, the actual cases that we have. The model is going to be some sort of more compact description or representation of the data, right? So if we had, for instance, have everyone's heights, we could easily come up with a model that explains height perfectly by saying our model is we're going to look up uh, which person you are. You know, we're going to look you up by name, and then we list your height. That's a very complicated model because if we have 20 people, we have to have basically 20 variables, right, to say which person are you? Are you person one, person two, person three? And then it would tell us what your height is. A simpler model would, for instance, tell us maybe your height based on your weight. That's one variable that is going to explain a lot of the variation in a second variable. So that would be a more compact description of the data, but that model is not going to be perfect, right? And it's going to allow some error, right? If I predict your height based on already knowing your height and looking it up in a table, first of all, that's not really much of a prediction. But secondly, it's a very complicated model. In contrast, if I'm going to make an estimate of your height based on what I know about your weight, right, then I actually have a relatively simple model based on one variable um, that would give me a probably pretty reasonable prediction about your height. Uh, it's going to be errorful, and it could probably be improved upon. For instance, uh, things about your, uh, your, your sex might, might factor into your height. Uh, your uh, country of birth might factor into your height. Right? All these things might actually improve my model's prediction and being able to determine your height beyond just your weight. So uh, there's always going to be a trade-off between how complicated is our model and how much error is left over. And the simplest case for a model is what we would call an unconditional model. An unconditional model is going to estimate one value for every person. So it estimates one value that gives us the best explanation of the data. So for instance, on a fair coin, the probability of a chaining heads is about 0.5, right? 50% of the time we should get heads, 50% of the time we should get tails. So having a model that predicts the probability of heads equals 0.5 will leave some amount of error depending on how the data actually shook out. Right? If I flip a coin right, uh, 10 times on any individual flip, I'm either going to have heads or tails. Okay, so now it's never going to be 0.5, right? It'll either be heads, which would have been maybe be a one, or tails, which would be a zero. But on average, it's going to be very close to 0.5. Right? So in very large samples, 
estimating a probability of 0.5 is probably going to be a good approximation. Certainly we might get a few runs of heads in a row if we only do coin, 10 coin flips, or runs of tails in a row if we only do 10 coin flips. But if we did 100 or 1,000 or 10,000, uh, it's going to get closer and closer and closer um, to that 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 would be a very good unconditional model for the probability of heads uh, on a coin flip. Now, we can make these things more complicated, right? So uh, having conditional models, like we talked about in the previous slide. So in a conditional model, our estimate is contingent on some other factor. We're gonna estimate the value of one variable based on the value of a second variable, maybe even two variables or more as our models get more complicated. So like we said before, we could have an estimate of a person's height modified by their weight. The heavier you get, maybe the taller I predict that you're going to be. Um, our estimate of a person's height could also be modified by their birth sex, right? So for instance, if you were um, cis male, maybe I have a certain expectation for what your height is. If you're cis female, I have a different expectation for what your height is, right? And, and those are going to be variables that could either be continuous or categorical, but our estimate of your height is still conditional on those variables in either case. Then once we have these models, as we said, there are going to be trade-offs between how complicated our model is and how much error it could potentially explain. So there's an important question of how do we actually compare these models? Well, let's say that one researcher proposes that a person's height is totally unrelated to their weight. They propose an unconditional model of height in which height, represented by y sub i, um, is a function of some intercept and is not modified by the person's weight. So weight, represented by x sub i, is getting multiplied by zero. So effectively, weight has no influence on a person's height, because regardless of what your weight is, it goes to zero. We're going to estimate beta, this one value, for everyone. And sure, we might be off, which is why we have epsilon sub i, but the argument is that this unconditional model is the best approximation of a person's weight, or sorry, a person's height. Let's say that another researcher proposes, proposes that a person's height is related to their weight. So this would be a conditional model. So they're going to estimate a person's height, y sub i, is equal to some intercept, beta zero, plus a slope, beta one, times the person's weight, x sub i. So in this situation, the person's weight actually has an influence on our estimate for their height because it is being multiplied by some non-zero value. And we're going to update or incorporate this person's weight into our estimate, estimate for a person's height. And again, it's probably going to have some amount of error. It's probably not going to be a perfect explanation of a person's height, but is it going to be better than the unconditional model? And how do we compare these two different sets of estimates? So if we had access to all the data, that is, we were able to measure everyone to whom our model applies. Maybe we said, I want to know about the heights of every human adult in the United States, right? We could simply add up all the errors and compare our two different models. So we could look at the, uh, the augmented model or the more complicated model, right, in which we have uh, height conditional on weight contrasted against the compact model or the simpler model in which height is not conditional on weight, right? And you can see basically this one has one parameter, beta zero, so it's compact. This one has two parameters, beta zero and beta one, so it's augmented or complex. Okay, and if, if we had access to the whole population, we could just add up all the errors and then say, well, which one was more errorful, right? If, if we had one that was less errorful than the other for everyone, it would be easy to say which model is better. However, we face some important issues here um, because we're usually not going to be able to measure all the data. We can't actually go out and collect all of the data from our whole population. We're usually collecting some sample of our population and then we have to make an inference from what we see in the sample back to the level of the population. And therefore, we're going to have to put some error bars around uh, what we think is happening because we, we will have to temper our expectations a little bit and say, this is what we observed in the sample. Um, therefore, we think that maybe these are some reasonable values in the population, but we're not 100% sure what the population looks like. Maybe we happen to get some very tall people in our sample. Maybe we happen to get some very short people. Maybe our sample is perfectly representative, right? We don't really know just from looking at our sample by itself. So we have to be relatively cautious in interpreting what's happening in our sample.
So that's one of the major issues that we're going to face, is that we aren't going to get to measure everyone. But there are a couple of other questions that we need to consider when we're trying to decide what model is the best explanation of our data. First, we need to decide how big of a reduction in error is really important. For instance, if we reduce error by 1%, is that worth the added complexity of an additional variable? Right? Maybe if one variable explains an additional 1%, that's not so bad. But if we have to add 10 more variables to explain 1%, it doesn't sound like those 10 variables are very good. Right? And those are sort of intuitions right now. But over the scope of this course, we're going to actually talk about how to formalize those intuitions um, and make sense of them and apply uh, mathematical rules for making these decisions. So the other thing that we have to consider is when we are looking at these reductions in error, right, and how much is really meaningful, we can't just look at the raw difference in error. We're going to look at a proportional reduction in error, or the value known as pre, as it's described in your textbook. So we're going to take the error in our compact model, essentially what's the simplest explanation of our data? Not necessarily the best, but what is the simplest? compare that to the more complicated model. So we're going to take the error from the compact model, subtract off the error from the augmented model, and then divide by the error from the compact model. So this will give us then a proportional reduction in error relative to how much error there was to begin with. Right, so if the error in the compact model was 100, for the sake of argument, and the error in the augmented model was 90, the proportional reduction in error would be 1 minus 90 over 100, or 10%. And 10% may or may not be very good, right? It kind of depends on what is the variable that we're talking about and how much variation is there. But at least by putting it into a proportional reduction in error, we can now actually establish some rules for pre across many different types of models and many different types of variables, right? Because now it doesn't matter if we measured 10 people or 100 people or 10,000 people. Right? As our sample size changes, we're normalizing based on the errors that we observe in the sample. So we're going to have a proportional reduction in error that we can use as a very useful statistic across many different types of situations. So as we get to the end of this very first module, um, there are a few things that I want to talk about. Um, but the, the biggest thing I want you to kind of take home is that a lot of what we're going to be doing in data analysis is formalizing your intuitions about how to make decisions. You guys are all excellent decision makers, by and large, in your daily life. right? Uh, and you intuitively weight a lot of the variables that we'll discuss. Right? For instance, you weight some measure of effect size. So if I want to say, well, does height vary with weight, we would want to see to what degree do those things tend to co-vary. Certainly, not everyone who's taller is necessarily heavier, um, but most shorter people tend to also be lighter, especially if we incorporate, let's say, children into this, not just adults. It definitely seems to scale, right? It's not randomly distributed. We very seldom see somebody who's one foot tall and 300 pounds. That doesn't tend to happen, right? And, and we very seldom see, see someone who is seven feet tall and 35 pounds. That also does not tend to happen. Height and weight don't seem to be randomly distributed. They do seem to co-vary. However, there is some variability in that relationship. And not everyone who is taller is necessarily heavier. So we have to balance the effect size against the variability that we observe. Um, and another determinant of that is going to be the sample size. Right? If I want to say, does height tend to vary with weight? and I see that relationship in my sample. If I see that in a sample of two people, that's not particularly meaningful, right? And intuitively, we don't trust that a whole lot. If I see it in 10, maybe I trust it a bit more. If I see it in 100, maybe I really start to think, you know what, I think there's something to this height-weight relationship. So effect size and sample size are things that are sort of going to work together towards our statistical certainty. Bigger effects, bigger relationships are easier to find. And if you use bigger and bigger samples, that's going to help improve the certainty you have uh, that the pattern you're observing is correct. And on the opposite side of this little seesaw is the variance. Right? Variance works against these other two factors right? and is going to create uncertainty in our relationships. So if we have a very small effect with a lot of variability, we need a really big sample to measure it. Conversely, if we have a small effect 
but maybe we can remove some of the variability. For instance, in the way that we design our experiment or the way we design our conditions, we can actually use a smaller sample because now the variance has gone down. And everything we do in, a stati in statistics is going to be an elaboration and specification of this idea, right? We're going to think about how these factors work against each other and how they tip this balance. And how far does this seesaw need to tip before we think that a relationship is statistically interesting or unlikely to have happened uh, essentially by chance? And that's not the best explanation, uh, and we'll get into more detailed, uh, wordy, lengthy explanations of what we actually mean as the course goes forward, but you can kind of think about it in those terms. What we really want to do is uh, try to establish relationships that we think are just sort of random fluctuations in our data from the relationships that are real and reliable um, and are going to show up if someone else ran the same experiment, right? or if we wanted to generalize from our sample back to the larger population. So again, we're going to be making models based on the data that we observe, and we're going to want to pick models that reduce error to a significant degree. So thanks very much for listening to this uh, module, and I'll see you all in the next video.